as everyone will know, so Mank is coming out uh, uh, quite soon. I think it's December the 4th. it would be another date later on, but I think it's December the 4th. So uh, Mank is a David Fincher film uh, about uh, the writing of Citizen Kane. And uh, we did a Chris Nolan top 10 just in advance of Tenet, because Nolan had made 10, it was his 11th film. So Jack and I decided to do the similar thing with uh, our top 10 uh, of uh, of David Fincher's films, not including Max. I've seen Max. You haven't yet, but you will see it by the time it comes out. And then what we will do is we oh, will do. I can't believe you've seen it, and you've also given me like a pre-review sort of teaser, and it's annoying me. I want I want to be able to talk about it with you. Well, as soon as soon as you've seen it, we'll record the we'll record the podcast. Then we'll put that out when Mank is is available. But like, what I want to do with that Great. discussion is I want to talk about Citizen Kane. I mean, yes, we'll talk about Mank as well, but I want to talk about Citizen Kane because. I think it's. I, I think Citizen Kane often gets you know sort of thought of as a sort of stuffy museum piece, but I think it is. There's a reason why it kept being the called the best film of all time. So there are ten David Fincher films in advance of Mank. Mank is the eleventh. So it, we're going to do the same rules as before with our top ten. Now when we did this with Nolan, it went over more than one podcast. This may go over more than one. I don't think it'll go to three. But again, what we've done is... I don't think is... anyone's going to complain, though. Everybody loved those ones. I'm, I'm very excited about this. I feel very similarly about David Fincher as I do about Christopher Nolan. I don't think okay. that there's much I can say bad about David Fincher. Like, none of his films are... It's a, it, well, wow. I mean, let's let's get on. Let's with it. get on we'll with it. Okay. That. So, what we'll do, I think, Jack, is the same rules as before that we will call the movies down in in opposite order, and we won't talk about them until we've both called. So if I say okay. number ten, you go, we will talk about the movies at the point that our that our paths converge. Does that make sense to you? It makes sense. Are you going to pull out some? bonkers orders again like putting the dark knight last in the trilogy order are you going to do something like that am i going to get are you going to put the curious case of benjamin button in the top three is that what's about to happen uh shall we i'm worried shall 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 we get ahead and discover okay so yes we should and before we do i just want to make a small confession yeah out of the 10 films i haven't seen alien 3 okay i just want to say that now alien 3 i haven't seen and an even further confession to the confession I'm not that keen on Alien anyway. Okay, J- so Jack, you not being keen on Alien is a whole other podcast. Okay, so so let's not go okay. there yet. All right. So I think the first Alien ones. I think it's I think it's good, uh, but I'm never I'm not keen on Aliens, and so I'm not really particularly keen in the one that everyone says is so, really yeah. terrible. So that is a whole other podcast, which we will probably <laughs> end up doing. So. Jack, at number 10, yes, in, in the top 10 of the 10 of the... We know it's 11. What is your number 10 David Fincher film? So by default, it has to be Alien 3. Okay. And my number 10 is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. And then... <gasps> and then my number, my number 9 is Alien 3. So... Since you've not seen it, I'll just do Alien 3 quickly and get it out of the way, and then we can... I've seen bits. Okay. I've seen some clips online. I've seen some discussion. Yeah. That, that, I, I would say that doesn't count, but the weird thing about Alien 3 is I've seen it many times, and it is always like watching a bunch of bits. So the, 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 short, version, <laughs> the short version of the Alien... The reason Alien 3 is, is at number nine, and we'll talk about Benjamin Button a, a bit further down. The reason Alien 3 for me is... I, I, wor- I did swither about putting it at number 10 because I think it is the worst. But the, the point is it's not, it, it's not Fincher's fault. Fincher did not set out to make the film that yeah. we have. Um, uh, as you, everyone will know, I did a very I did a documentary about the evolution of the Alien movies, and there was one large section of it was about Vincent Ward and what Vincent Ward was going to do with Alien Three when it was going to be the name of the Rose in Space, and how Vincent Ward then got edged out of the project by the producers who just didn't have any faith in him. They were just worried that that, that this multi million dollar franchise was about to be given to somebody who had a vision, and they didn't want that. And, of course, what happened was <laughs> they ended up with a botched script on which uh, Vincent Ward ended up getting a story credit, you know, a, a, screen, a script credit, but nothing else. And if you look at the... I mean, the whole the whole myth was Vincent Ward could never figure out how to do it. It's not true. If you look at the, the plans that Vincent Ward had, he clearly had a very 
very good idea of how to do it and the film would have made a lot of sense and then they just threw it out they threw out the whole you know monk planet the wood planet the you know the angel demon stuff that's all at the heart of finch's very interesting script which was described and i think rightly so as you know the name of the rose in space and they just made it into a prison planet movie with a bunch of cgi alien running around and people shouting fuck the preponderance of the word fuck in the script was so great that Alien 3 t-shirts for the production crew, and it was a horrible production as far as I can tell, said Alien 3, and on the back they just said the word fuck in inverted commas. Because that was the <laughs> level... No, seriously, that was the level to which it, it had descended. Fincher himself set out to make a very different film, and you can see versions of Fincher's vision in the slight, in the reconstructed version that I think Charlie Dillaritz oversaw, because Fincher, of course, wouldn't go back and do the director's cut when they yeah came- he walked off before the edit was even complete. I think yes, and when they finally went back to him when they were doing the sort of the box set stuff and said, "Look, you know, would you like to reconstruct it?" The, the message was basically, "No, you, you missed the chance." I think he had a he was bruised on it. He was clearly a, a very very good director. He quit filmmaking for a while because of it. Yeah, he but- made Alien Three in nineteen ninety. Is that correct? Sounds about right, Is that when yeah. that film was made? And then didn't make Seven until 1995. It might have even been earlier. Yeah. Alien 3 might have... Yeah, it might have been even earlier than that, but he was out of the game for a while. The game. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Very good. But it is it, it is, it is a mess. It's not his fault. Um, I remember talking to uh, Charles Dance about how you know how what it was like and when, when they knew and I, I know charles dance through somebody i've known him for a while so charles he, he's great um and he took of course is, is in May. hey knowing charles dance is i think that's as, as far as you know kind of name drops concerned that's pretty cool fine. uh 1992 alien 3 apparently um and i've talked to him about how much on set it kind of became a war of attrition with the producers and, you know, how everyone felt demoralised by what was happening. Um, Ralph Brown says the same thing. And we know that it wasn't the film it was meant to be. I reviewed it for Q magazine when it came out in the abominable final version. I remember finishing my review with the with the line, seemed clever at the time, in space no one gives a shit. And uh, that was Great. that was how I felt about it. It's clever it. now. Thank you. I think it's fair to say that our smoothly running facility has suddenly developed a few problems. I can only hope we are able to all pull together over the next few days until the rescue team arrives for Lieutenant Ripley. It's here. You got Clemens. Stop this raving at once. I'm Stop telling it. you. It's here. Just get there and get that foolish woman back to the infirmary. Fuck! Uh, so yeah, an alien, uh, alien three at number nine for me. Benjamin Button, I find worse because it's the film he wanted it to be. What was your number nine? My number nine is Panic Room. Okay, but so we can talk about eight. Benjamin Button. And we- is the curious case okay. of Benjamin Button. Very good. And um, my number eight is the game. So let's do Benjamin Button first. Oh. You go first because I've just gone on about Alien 3. Okay. So I've only seen the curious case of Benjamin Button twice. I saw it a long time ago and could barely remember it. So it's one of the ones I knew I had to rewatch before doing this podcast. And it's weird how much of it like stuck. Like it feels like it clung to my brain somehow. And so I was watching it unfold and I was like, I definitely remember this well. And on this rewatch, the thing that really stuck out to me was how fucking weird it is. It's such a weird film. Like I'm watching it being like, okay, so it's a bit like Pinocchio. It's got that sort of, old storybook kind of vibe to it it's a you know a lot of people have compared it to something like Forrest Gump the sort of the lifelong span of a of a character and all the people he touches along the way but I just found a lot of the stuff that it's like set against like some of the backdrop the story structure of it I was like this is odd it's like why does he need to be old because also other than the fact that he is old and he ages in reverse there's nothing special about this character it's not like there's any anything coming out he's not a particularly you know magnetic presence or anything it's just it's brad pitt imagine if it wasn't brad pitt you'd be way less interested what i liked about it what really stuck out to me and i don't think this is what the film is solely about because it's about so many things but the thing where he 
as a child who looked like an old man meets this girl and they're like childhood friends and then they meet in the middle of their age and they become lovers and then as they as she gets older and he gets younger although he gets dementia as a little boy which is just such a heartbreaking thing to watch and did actually i found that very emotional but it was the changing relationship between brad pitt and kate blanchett where by the end she's got this sort of motherly relationship with him and i find that you know there's moments of beauty throughout of it but it's just so fucking weird it's just such a weird film and i couldn't ever get that out of my head and you're right it it's all what fincher wanted it to be and so when it ends and it's got the robert zemeckis font but it says directed by david fincher i just feel confused i think that fincher's really good at setting a mood but i don't think the mood he's good at setting is romance I don't think he... It, it almost feels like a criticism of it, even though it's it. It's very strange. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, well, I mean, I've only seen it once and I have no desire to see it again. I mean, I, I know... I've read people who've read it and they said, when you see it again, it is more emotional. I mean, I, funnily enough, I remember it quite clearly. I mean, I remember the the images that you're talking about there and, and I remember the bits of people say, when I watch that again, it really struck me and it you know in my own person for my own personal reasons there are reasons why i feel that that should it should touch me personally but i just remember watching the film when it came out and thinking this is this is and this is the forest gum comparison this is a film that exists because the technology has allowed it to and it's a short story and yeah you're and, right and I, it, it is just because the it, guy it's like a it joke just, that wears itself out it's like yeah i get it because he, he's old but he's supposed to be young uh i, yeah. I get it and there's, and it's you know again we come down to the you know the Jurassic Park thing you know you, you were so busy wondering whether you could you never stopped to think <laughs> if you should and I think the uh, I think the fact is with Benjamin Button you you shouldn't I just um, <laughs> I just don't know and I feel this about a few things that Finch has done but this so the most is I don't understand why he wanted to tell it I don't know what, why what is it about this thing that was, he was like yeah that's that's what I want to do next. And I also think you're right that it should be a short story, but it's actually, I think, Fincher's longest film. Yeah, although it is a short story, and 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 that, the, the whole thing that that I think it's that I'm, I'm always reminded of this thing that that Kurt Vonnegut said that the big problem with science fiction novels. Um, there's a character in Kurt Vonnegut's uh, a books called uh, Kilgore Trout, who's a science fiction writer. And the, the thesis in Vonnegut's uh, uh, writing is that the, science, the ideas in science fiction novels are great, but the writing is often terrible. And so what he does is he just paraphrases. He says, Kilgore Trout once wrote a novel in which, and then he describes the central idea of the novel in a few paragraphs. And that's great. The idea is great, but you'd never want to read the novel. Um, and I do feel like with Benjamin Button, it's what it is. You could, you know, it is, it's a, it's a thing and you go and the thing is that he's living that and she's living that and then it goes like that and the thing and you go that's a nice idea anyway let's go for a walk <laughs> <laughs> rather than let's sit down and watch it all play out in front of us yeah it, there's never a mo it's doing too much stuff as well just even on a uh, technical filmmaking level it's like the clunkiest of Fincher's films because he's usually very efficient and very direct with what he's doing and Benjamin Button seems to be juggling lots of different things within the first 10 or 15 minutes and I'm like I'm not sure what's going on actually I think another comparison that comes to mind is uh, my favorite Tim Burton film which is Big Fish and I think that film I like Big Fish love Big Fish and I think that film does yeah. the same thing that Benjamin Button's doing that sort of storyteller telling you something that you're not sure what happened and what's exaggerated and all the rest of it as this person is dying and i think big fish does that in a really beautiful sentimental and surreal way and fincher hasn't got the chops for that and i don't think that's a criticism of fincher i just think that he picked the wrong genre it's like what are you doing you're the guy who made seven what are you making this for but i don't mind genre hopping i just think i just <sighs> I just think, I mean, at the point which I agree is, like I said, short story. Why, 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 why am I, why am I watching it at such length? Why it, it's just, and also it, it, it's an, it's a, it's a story of an idea. It's not a film. Some people were born to sit by a river. Some get struck by lightning. Some have an ear for music. Some are artists. 
Some swim. Some no buttons. Some no Shakespeare. Some are mothers. And some people dance. Now, I'm troubled that you had as your number eight panic room. No, yeah? number nine was panic room. I had it. I number had, nine was panic room. Yeah. Okay. So my number, my number eight is the game. Okay. What's your number eight? So my number eight was the curious case of Benjamin Button. My number seven okay, so is the game. Is the game. Okay, fine. So then we can move on to the game. You want to go first? No, please go ahead. The game is one of those films that has garnered respect over the years. Um, people now sort of cite it as a much better film than it than it was given credit for. I don't think it is. <laughs> Not least because... And I know this sounds like a, a fatuous criticism. I remember sitting there watching it when I was when I was a teenager. And I've told this story a million times. I went to see a Razorhead with my friend Nick Cooper, and Nick Cooper just sat through the whole film, huffing and puffing. And and then there was a moment when the, the you know the 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 imaginary baby with the head that at this point grown to the size of the room, whilst the woman was singing behind the radiator and Henry was hiding under. He turned to me and he went, that wouldn't happen. And I remember thinking, <laughs> in terms of the game, the only thing I could think was, no, no, <laughs> just, just no. And, and it, because, because it was so fundamentally no, and we know that that idea has subsequently been, you know, done in other forms. Everyone goes, oh, it's like the game, you know, oh, it's the game, oh, it's like the game. And I just go, no. <laughs> do you know what it is i like that david fincher seems to especially in his early career and he's and it goes up until like kind of gone girl is that every now and again he goes i just want to do a, a fun one i want to just sort of do this i want to do one where like oh she's locked in a panic room let's see what happens oh i'm going to do one where a guy is in a game so you don't know what's real and what's not i'm going to do one where halfway through it turns out spoilers she did it all along and we're just going to, you know, we're going to follow that journey. It's mad pulpy stuff that he likes to do. Um, and I really like the game. And I think to me, it feels like, it almost feels like Inception, but you're watching uh, Killian Murphy's character the whole time. That's what it feels like. It feels like someone has, str- like David Fincher, he is the game in the way that it's Nolan's dream. So like, he has just gone, what are the mechanics I need to take this character from this point in his life to this point in his life and how can I make just like a big, fun, silly, pulpy thriller out of that? And so he's just going, all right, I'm going to put him into these extreme situations and make him realise these things about himself and put him under pressure. And at the same time, I think that that is a criticism of high society and rich people because in order to feel anything, these are the lengths that they have to go to in order to feel basic human emotions. But the whole story really, kind of like at the deep down Inception, I've said this last time, that Inception is a therapy movie about Dom Cobb getting over the death of his wife or realising that he was responsible for it in some way. The game is about Michael Douglas's character realising that he doesn't need to have complete control over his life. And that doesn't mean that he'll end up like his father and jumping off a roof, which, you know, there's a literal parallel in the movie of that happening. I think it's really smart. But yeah, but I also think it's really silly and it knows it's really silly and it's just doing it to give you the also the meta cinema structure to take you on a ride that's going to be satisfying but along the way you're just going to have loads of fun and there's going to be loads of stupid twists about who's in on it and who's not. Okay, but but he, but here's the thing. I agree with everything that you've just said. But that's not subtext. I mean that's literally the text of the film. Yeah, but I, I mean, think the thing about- wearing that on its sleeve sort of gives it permission to just go and have a laugh oh could be so you're saying that because there's no because there's no attempt to hide the fact that it is exact it is about exactly what it says it's about yep that they might as well just have fun with it uh, yeah and i think the only thing i don't particularly like is that the ending sort of undercuts it a little bit i think i okay. almost feel like the i wish ending- that didn't the end the ending where he it turns out that it is all part of the game and he just gets yes. given a t-shirt. The ending is one of the stupidest endings. 
Oh, well, I, I was and wondering it, whether or not you were going to have some sort of like, oh, but is that real or not sort of theory. I thought no, you were going to like, no, fold it's on real. that rises. No, <laughs> no, it's absolutely real. It's as stupid as it looks. That's the thing. And, me, and, and, that's, and, and that's the problem for me. It's like, it's, it, it, is ex- it is exactly the movie that you just described. And somebody asleep in the back row would get that. It is it is like a movie which is going, all right, up in the, up there in the balcony, you getting this? He's discovering <laughs> that there is more to life than what he thought at the beginning. It is all being organised. As... <laughs> going, By David, Sean Penn. Okay, Sean got, Penn organised all yes, of right. this. <laughs> That's right, yes. And he knew every single thing that was going to happen, including the... Ju- I think as well. I, I just, just think go. that it's so well made, and everyone in it is so good. Like I really like every time that the TV starts speaking to him, I still go oh, because it's done so well. It's not like really corny and cheesy, even though you know the whole thing is really, is corny, really corny and cheesy. And cheesy. <laughs> the whole thing is, <laughs> but the way that they do it, it has. I don't know. It just works. I think Fincher knows how to do that sort of stuff and make it work. That's my take. I think it's allowed to be silly and fun, uh, and, and I'm fine with that. Never mind who that is. You want to know how a camera got into your home, don't yes, you? Yes, I would. Cold? Colder. Warm? Write this number down. It's a 24 hour consumer recreation services hotline for emergencies only. But don't call asking what the object of the game is. Figuring that out is the object of the game. Good luck and congratulations on choosing C. I look at women when it comes to sex. As a Rubik's Cube, you have to figure this Rubik's Cube out. You don't pick up a Rubik's Cube, go bam, 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 and then the Rubik's Cube is up. never. Unless you're Will Smith in Pursuit of Happiness, it's just not happening. <laughs> <laughs> My Love Is is a podcast brought to you by Bumble, hosted by me, Irene TTYA. I'll be getting advice from some of Britain's biggest household names, discussing the topics we really wish we knew about dating. Episodes release every Thursday via iTunes and Spotify, so stay tuned and follow at Bumble underscore UK for all the juicy bits. Hi, I'm Catherine Ryan from Telling Everybody Everything, a comedy podcast where I always try to help. I love watching the Pride of Britain Awards every year, and it reminds me to say thank you to ordinary people doing extraordinary things in my community. TSB has been proudly partnering Pride of Britain for five years, celebrating the heroes who make the everyday better for everyone. So whether it's a kind stranger who picked up your shopping or maybe a friend reached out when they knew you were low, thanking someone for the small acts that meant a lot to you is a life made more. Catch up on the Pride of Britain Awards on the ITV Hub. This episode of Kermode on Film is sponsored by Mojave's. Mojave's is an award-winning designer in footwear innovation. They took the shoe we all look to for comfort, the slipper, and ripped up the rulebook to create something functional and beautiful that welcomes you home. The Mojave's design team has been busy reworking their classic slipper during lockdown, and they're excited to bring you the new Mojave's Curve. The new Mojave's Curve has a unique toe design feature to protect it from scuffing and make the slippers durable and long-lasting. They're also created using recycled fibres and premium organic Italian wool, providing a new level of luxury and comfort whilst keeping individuality and style. Mojave slippers, durable, comfortable and designed to last. Welcome home. Visit mojaves.com, that's M-A-H-A-B-I-S dot com, and use the code Kermode 10 for 10% off today.
one of the things that's interesting is that we're, I mean we're still fairly high up the list and you're still on movie and you're now already on movies that you really like which means that everything else you like more than that. Yeah, I, because you're I like all of it. these films. I even enjoy watching... Okay. This is the thing. Like, I've got Panic Room at number nine, which is my least favourite Fincher film, but I have Curious Case of Benjamin Button above that because I think <laughs> I just was a bit more like like taken by Benjamin Button this time than I was back because I think Panic Room's a bit boring. Where's Panic Room for you? Are we at number seven for you yet? Okay, so what's up? Okay, no, so hang on. So my number seven is The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Okay. So what's so so your number seven was was the game, but my number six is the girl with the dragon tattoo, <laughs> and my number six is Panic Room. Ah. So since you brought since you brought up, we kind of first, we're doing all right at the moment. We're sort of in the same sort of spots. Yeah, we're not a million miles away now. I I should say I like Panic Room. I really I really enjoy it. I like um, Panic early Room. Early great too. performance. Early great performance by Kay Stew, who of course is you know has gone on to be one of the greatest things evs. Um, I think one of the, one of the one of the the, the reasons I lo- oh I, you don't think uh, no I don't I don't think that Kristen Stewart is very okay, good. okay that's another podcast that's another podcast why why is Case Stew great or not anyway <laughs> I th- one of the things <laughs> I really like about Panic one of the re- yes she apparently she's not busy one of the things that I really like uh, about Panic Room other than the design and the sort of the the, the stripped down nature of it is that it has a real kind of Hitchcockian logic. I mean, it's an architecturally constructed plot. I mean, quite literally an architecturally constructed plot. And it's to do... I think partly this was to do with when it came out. At the time that it came out, that idea of barricading yourself into a safe room in your house struck a particular chord. Because I had never heard of a panic room. I mean, I had never heard of it. I know I now... I know now that people do, you know, the, the, the idea is quite familiar. But I remember people going, what's a panic room? We, 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 did, we had no idea what it was. And oh, what, it's a room in... I just remember it because I was a kid when it came out. And to me, panic room sounded like a horror film. It just sounded like, oh, mm. like, like that sounded so foreign to me that it just sounded like I never wanted to see it. But it also sounds like a room that you go into in order to enjoy panicking rather than it's a room that you go into because you're panicking and therefore you go into... So I... I really. What do you mean? <laughs> but it's it's like a room you go into to enjoy panicking. Yeah, because if you say it's something like a panic room, it's like a chill out room, or a you know, or a something. It's a panic. Oh, let's go to the panic room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my panic room. That's where I chill out and read. That's right. And that's my that's panic, my panic room. room. And that's my gym. <laughs> Whenever I'm being like, I need a little panic. That's my gym, and that's, that's, that's where I go to calm down. That's where I go for a panic. <laughs> Whereas, it, well, that's what it sounded like. That's what a panic room sounded like. You know, hey, come on. It's like that's when I go when I need to calm down. Yeah. Little that's, panic room. But I, if you feel yourself like on the edge, that's where you go. There's lots of things in there Jack, that you need. Here's the yeah, thing. There's water. Here's the thing. I mean, yeah, a blanket's in yes, there. It, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I but I'd never heard the phrase before. And and bear in mind, back at the time, I don't think any you know most other people hadn't. And then when you go, oh, it's that thing that you barricade yourself into something because you've. Bar-. It's like okay, fine. So the whole film is about the way in which people barricade themselves into things. And you know, and that becomes more dangerous than the thing about. No, I just thought it was. It, it, it kind of has that. Like I said, it has an architectural logic to it. It looks fantastic. I think it looks really, it really good. It's got that early Fincher sort of. I don't know if voyeuristic is the word. It is for voyeuristic. It, that, that sort of impossible camera yeah. where it sort of goes through keyholes, and you know, he does that quite a lot in Fight Club as well. Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a genre film, and it and it's kind of stripped down. And I I mean I yeah, it's stripped back. It's nuts and bolts. It's it's the same as the game. It's like here's what you need to know. We're gonna play with these things now. It's like some of the things I don't like uh, are like oh she's got. Uh, asthma or something she's got something like that where you need to give her a shot otherwise she'll go into a coma is like okay this feels like you've just gone well, we need something <laughs> we need something that's gonna like p- p- give jeopardy to this situation but I, do, I don't have i don't have any problem with devices because it's, it's a genre film i don't have any problem with a device which says okay here's the thing you're, you're locked in this thing and then you've got to do this other thing it's a i mean f- for one thing jack you you're somebody who in real life has gone to those escape room things right you know, you go to those escape rooms and you go somewhere and you... Well, it, it's kind of... This, it's a similar sort of logic to it. You, it can find, oh, I miss escape rooms. Can, yeah. Yeah, it's that. It's Panic Room and the game are similar to, to that. It's that very, like, problem-solve-it yeah. type of filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. and, I, and I, I think it works. I think on that level it works. 
And it also is a family drama as well. It's all dressed up in a thriller, but it's just about this little um, separated family and their little drama. I think that that's really good. And I think it's nice to see Jared Leto get shot in the face. <laughs> what the fuck is this? There's a little girl on the top floor. There's a woman on the third. They're both asleep. They're not supposed to be here. This is your department, you Hey, they are not supposed to be here. Videotape. What? We're on videotape. We've been on videotapes and we got within 10 feet of this place. And the tape's from upstairs. Fucking day escrow. Fuck to me, man. Fucking day escrow, man. That's almost three weeks. They should not be in here for another week. How? Exactly how? It's 14 days, three weeks. Business days. Escrow is always business days, five day weeks, always. So let's talk about the girl with the dragon tattoo. Yes, okay. So, um... So the the girl with the girl with the dragon tattoo. Uh, so I pre- for, for for dropping a for name dropping here. I presented the BAFTA for foreign language film. Uh, the, the, oh, okay. We're making it a remake situation. Yeah, the it. year that the original girl with the dragon tattoo won, and uh, and I did a fantastic speech um, uh, that was then cut from the that was then cut from the BBC broadcast, which was a shame. Um, Unbelievable! Because they, how dare they? Yes, well, no, no. Because I ended don't up. Don't they know who you are? I, the, well, Apparently not. Otherwise well, they well, I wasn't. You out. I wasn't anybody. But um, uh, but uh, of course, what they did was at the end of the ceremony, they went also on tonight's BAFTAs of foreign language film Oscar, uh, best sound design, uh, best grip making a cup of tea you know I would say because it was foreign language film at that point they just thought oh that's no one cares about that stuff nowadays they wouldn't do that because nowadays they'd be embarrassed about the idea but back then foreign language film got shoved into the all not English yeah not English cut it get it out <laughs> and uh, and at the uh, at, at the Oscars at, at the BAFTAs that year there were a bunch of um, American producers and American filmmakers in in the audience um Weinstein, obviously, and uh, and everyone else, and I, and Fincher was up for something, but he couldn't be there because he was in the process of remaking it. And I said in my speech, you know, film is an international language, due to the you know the, the miracle of subtitles, it is possible for films in any language to be understood by anyone around the world, except for in America, where they have to remake them in American. Um, and then uh, Girl with Dragon Tattoo won the BAFTA and then the next year's Fincher. So my problem with the Fincher is there is nothing, and I mean nothing, in the Fincher that improves upon the original film. It's not to say I don't think it's slick and beautifully filmed, because it is, but it isn't moving the dial forward at all. That said, it's very well made, and I think the comparison would be with me putting Insomnia quite a long way down the down the list on the Nolan films is it's good but it's not bringing a whole lot new to the table so I think that the the Fincher Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is a good film um as is and I think it's not like a bad film like Benjamin Button but it's it what it isn't is doing anything it is it's not doing anything new it's just telling a story which has been told before that's why I think Panic Room is is a better film so I'm gonna just start again by saying i haven't seen the original the way that i hadn't seen the original insomnia um so i can't compare them so i should check that out i need i I need to do that i think it's just because i'm more of a fincher fan yeah so but i love murder mysteries and detective noirs and crime thrillers like i love that sort of stuff so the idea as well that because what i might what i said about insomnia was the problem is it isn't seven and it wants to be seven. Um, and I think it, what's great is that Fincher, the guy who made seven and redefined that genre to the point where people couldn't really touch it, like they couldn't get to that point of making something that good. He keeps doing crime thrillers and each one of them doesn't feel like it's trying to do seven. I love the fact that every time he does something in this genre with their, where there's a murderer on the loose or whatever, it doesn't feel like he's just doing his shtick. And I think that is amazing because I think somebody who usually sticks to their own genre ends up repeating themselves a little bit. But Fincher doesn't feel like he does to me, which I think is great. Yeah, but weirdly, in the case of Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, I think he's repeating someone else. And and what I'd say is if you if you enjoy Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, watch the original because... For one thing, it's a lot nastier. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really. Yeah. So this is what I was going to say: is that I think that even though I, I would say that Finch's nastiest film 
is seven. I think it's his nastiest, like gruesome, yes. most gruesome watch. Yeah. But I think the events of Girl with a Dragon Tattoo make me want to look away more. Yeah, well, I think that he's not done anything worse than the 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 rape scene. Yeah, where it's just there. There it is. And it's just horrible to watch, and he makes you stay with it. Yeah. Which I understand why he's doing it. I'm not against that personally. I understand why somebody wouldn't enjoy that, and I don't think it's there to be enjoyed. I think obviously that's the point: is look at this horrible thing, and you understand now why she hates this so much. But I just find that very difficult to to watch. And then I think I really like Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I want to watch it. It's got that great murder mystery thing going on. And then I'm like, but there is a lot of rape in it. And I don't know if I want to sit and watch that again. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It's just got something about it that I don't although, really you know, want to revisit. I'd say that, 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 that all of what you've said is true of the first film and the effect... The, the, I mean, I remember watching the first film and being genuinely shocked by that equivalent scene in the first film. And and also, you know, it, clearly it's not, not done in a titillating way. It's done as it's meant to be ugly and horrible. It's meant to be about, you know, about power and control. Um, and it is. Uh, so I just I just think that Fincher moving the dial on has happened less. I had Irina down here in that cage. <laughs> Who's Irina, you might ask? Just another girl. Just another immigrant whore. Who misses that? Your sister wasn't... What? Your sister, Harriet, wasn't just another girl. You found her. What happened to her? You killed her. You useless fucking detective. It's too tired to talk. Good. I'm tired of talking to you. <laughs> Well, that's where we're going to leave it for this first part of our Kermit on Film David Fincher special. In the next edition, we're going to count down numbers five to one in our top ten David Fincher movies. Check out that podcast when it arrives. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed this podcast, remember to subscribe, tell your friends, keep watching the skies. Listener.